Hello and welcome to June's Newswire. And my name's Mark Morton. I'm head of tax at Mercia Group. And uh, the last month has been relatively quiet in terms of announcement from HMRC. Um, they don't have a lot to say in terms of groundbreaking issues. I suppose the big bit of news in the tax world, as you'll see in the uh, introduction to Newswire, is the passage of the Finance Act. So usually Finance Act yeah, gets passed just before the summer recess, so kind of just before the school holidays. However, this year it has been rushed through. Um, I can't say it's been hugely well scrutinised. Uh, um, looking at what went on, um, I suppose a couple of things that, that arise from that. If you've been on our finance bill courses, uh, really, I think one major change of note to, to what was covered relates to the super deduction. Obviously, with the super deduction being a first year allowance, um, then a number of, I suppose, the old fashioned restrictions apply. And one of those is the leasing or hiring of assets. So if you have a client that uh, runs a business which is leasing or hiring, then those items cannot qualify for first year allowances historically. And that rule gets brought into the super deduction. Uh, that was pointed out to uh, the government because that is fundamentally different to uh, annual investment allowance. And what the government have done is, is make a semi concession, if that's the right expression. What they've done is say that that restriction will not apply to plant and machinery leased with a building, i.e. as part of the letting of that building. So it may be that fixtures in a broad sense qualify um, even though the building with its, with its, within which they uh, sit is being leased out. However, more generally, uh, businesses which essentially just run leasing or plant hire uh, will continue not to qualify for the super deduction. So that, that's probably the main thing that I would highlight to you. Uh, if you've already seen our course, then uh, thanks for coming. If not, please feel free to log on to our uh, finance bill courses or alternatively we are doing a summer update which is a mixture of uh, case law and that finance act so again if you've not been on one of those courses then please feel free to join us thanks very much uh, also included in our newswire are a couple of uh, smaller articles one is something I've not had to claim for a while but the uh, fuel rates the authorized rates for company vehicles uh, but just so you know as more people are getting back to traveling and uh, interestingly touch wood at this stage keeps everything crossed so will i come the autumn then maybe we have to revisit those rates a little bit and uh, what you'll see having filled up uh, with a tank of petrol this morning um, fuel prices have gone up and consequently those authorized rates have changed a little bit uh, one would imagine they'll be changing again in the the next installment which runs from 1st of september but uh, just keep an eye on, on the fuel issue. Uh, one now, again, more for yourselves than for clients, is the agent dedicated helpline, uh, which I am not, trying not to be too sceptical, is a multi-oxymoron. I'll let you work out what you, what you think I may mean by that. But uh, the revenue having suspended that due to essentially COVID times, um, albeit they were all working at home for the last 18 months. Um, uh, working from home, again, may be a bit of an oxymoron in my recent experience of dealing with the revenue, uh, but um, the revenue have uh, said that they will, uh, they have essentially relaunched that agent dedicated helpline uh, and the service is so high, they promise to get to you in an average of 10 minutes. Uh, of course, you will always be part of the average, which is more than 10 minutes, but never mind. So uh, if, if you use the agent helpline, if you've found that of use, uh, then, then obviously it has resurrected itself. Um, again, uh, these day-to-day -day issues are, are covered in our autumn tax update course, which will start in September. And again, everything crossed at this stage. Just so you're all aware, it is our intention to return to venues. So if, like me, you're a bit zoomed out, then please feel free to uh, uh, book with us in a real sense for the autumn. Um, alternatively, if you've already booked an online, just go into your account. Uh, you can untick that box, tick a face to face, and hopefully I will see some of you for coffee and a biscuit. Won't that be nice? Uh, and we can discuss the strange times through which we've been living. 
You will also see in Newswire a little snippet regarding the VAT deferral period. Now, this goes back to uh, one of the initial COVID responses, which seems uh, a lifetime ago. And if you remember sort of middle of March to middle of June last year, uh, as the initial lockdown took effect, the government basically said, look, if you're due to pay VAT in this broadly three month period, you can just to choose not to pay. And the original terms of that deferral were that you had to pay it back to the government by essentially the last end of the last financial year, 31st of March last year. Of course, as the pandemic rolled on, the government then said, actually, don't worry about 31st of March. We'll give you a, a couple of options. And really, there were three options on the table. One was that you just paid the revenue, the money that you owed, and that was the end of it. Uh, the second one was a general sort of time to pay arrangement that you entered into with the revenue. And then the third one was the online facility that the revenue launched, which was a specific VAT deferral related, a bit of a mouthful, but VAT deferral related uh, process by way you could uh, register, go in and essentially choose how many installments you would like to pay that amount over. Uh, in the current financial year. And I've no doubt some of your clients entered into that. Now, the announcement within the um, newswire that we, we've picked up is that that online facility, that specific one that was created, has now closed. And consequently, your clients only have two options rather than three. One is that general time to pay. The other is uh, just to pay the revenue, the money. Now, the important thing, I suppose, with all of this is the reimposition of penalties uh, at the moment we've had no interest no penalties running on on this deferred amount for the last year uh, the government are now saying if you do not sort this out by 1st of july uh, so coming around fairly quickly then you will have uh, a five percent surcharge imposed so i suppose the critical thing now if you're aware of any clients who just haven't done something in terms of that uh, deferred amount, I think the, the simple answer is they've got to get in touch with the revenue one way or the other, otherwise they're going to be expecting a penalty through the post. So uh, again, a um, uh, bit of information that relates to our, I suppose, finance bill course. Um, so again, just to flag that up, if you haven't seen it, please feel free to uh, have a watch. You'll also see in the Newswire a link to a blog on Class 2 National Insurance and uh, the continuing saga that HMRC's computer systems do not be able to seem to be able to cope very well with Class 2 generally, uh, voluntary contributions of Class 2, uh, situations where the tax return is filed late but there is a payment of Class 2 voluntary or otherwise on there. And, and really ultimately behind this is, is a saga of computer systems when I started in the revenue a long, long time ago, uh, interestingly, the, the, the pay-as-you-earn computer system in those days, COP, well, COP and CODA were the, the two computer systems, if anybody is, is uh, as old as me and remember those. But the, the sort of um, tax systems which had been brought in were pretty basic in those days. But right from day one, they never interacted with the national insurance system. Um, national insurance system was, was dealt with up in Newcastle. So once a year, we essentially had to shut our systems down, do a big sort of data transfer to try and get that information tied up with National Insurance Contributions Office. Now, that has never worked very well. Uh, I think you fast forward to where we are now, the self-assessment system and the Class 2 system do, do, just do not interact uh, particularly well, and I'm sure you've all encountered this. The, the issue with this, and you'll see the revenue warning of this again, is saying, you know, well, basically, you shouldn't have filed your return late, or you shouldn't do this, or it's a problem, it's a problem fundamentally what they say is contact us and put it right and of course that's the ongoing aggravation for clients but but of course what they need to understand is you know, that's a year of their pension going missing if they don't sort it out uh, i think it's very tempting to say well i've got a credit on my account i've got a bit of a refund possibly from the revenue hooray hooray yeah but hold on a minute what's your pension worth to you and I think there's a much broader issue here. Um, a is people's pension histories. Most lay people don't understand their contributions record, what it means, where they can see it, etc. Um, not a straightforward system anyway. You've then got the interaction of child benefit as well. I think child benefit building up to be a big scandal in the future. You know, how many people understand the distinction between registering for your child benefit but not receiving the child benefit? 
uh, which may entitle you where appropriate to to a, a potentially, potentially what used to be called home responsibilities credit um, and just say oh well you know I can't be bothered because I'm gonna have to give it back to the revenue which which won't entitle you to a credit so any of these fundamental things plus the fact of course the number of credits you can have has changed over the years um, you know there's still scandals coming coming to light in respect of 20 30 years ago so again national insurance records i think is is quite a big deal uh, if you're not sure generally people's digital tax accounts have a summary whether people can actually understand it is a bit of a different matter but i think my general advice to clients would be look look at your own go away and find it register for your digital tax account and if it doesn't look right then come to us and we can look at it further but you know you have an obligation initially to to look and make sure uh, yours is vaguely correct so continuing saga of uh, national insurance the general theme of that article is ring us and we'll sort it out uh, of course if you don't ring by the agent helpline you'll be on the phone for 112 years and your pension will have uh, become due and payable by then but never mind uh, good luck on that uh, so-called HMRC, HMRC helpline great thanks for that mark well here it's june i can't quite believe that we've got as far as we have but the uh, sun is almost shining we're getting over some uh, torrential rain um but summer feels like it's on its way and this month we've got not much to talk about actually uh, there's only three things that are in our newswire for audit and accounting this month uh, let's start off with the accounting issue uh, and that is the covid19 rent concession and the extension to the deadline so you'll recall that we've had the amendment to uh, uk gap frs is 102 and 105 to allow that if you are given rent concessions that are solely due to covid19 rather than being related to any other change in the, uh, the terms of your lease then we should essentially take those as they fall uh, in the period in which we are expected to be compensated uh, and that applied to payments due before 30th of June 2021 and maybe that seemed right the, uh, the the good deadline when we made the amendment in the first place but here we are towards the end of June and we're still not out of lockdown yet and some businesses still might be affected by the fact that they are not able to fully trade from their premises and they're asking for concessions from the landlord so Internationally, we've seen an extension which has extended by a year to end of June 2022, the changes in IFRS 16. And we were kind of wondering whether we'd have a similar amendment in the UK. Well, we had one in draft and it's now been amended. So apart from the uh, implementation date text and so on that's gone into the standard, it's simply just a date change. What was 2021 is now 2022. So I think that makes sense. Um, all other aspects of the relief are the same. It's got to be related to COVID. It's not there for any other purpose. It doesn't apply to deferrals. It applies only to true concessions. But we've got that date change. It applies for periods commencing 1st of Jan 21 and early adoption is available. So that's it for accounting. Uh, let's talk about assurance and practice assurance. Uh, specifically, we've had the Institute's 2021 Practice Assurance Report, and uh, this is good reading. Um, particularly, it focuses on PCRT, Professional Conduct in Relation to Taxation. Uh, PCRT is disappointingly something that many firms aren't familiar with. Uh, it's been around for a couple of decades at least, and sets out the ethical principles under which we should act for clients in relation to their tax affairs uh, with HMRC. And uh, the practice assurance visits are focused on compliance with PCRT. Uh, it does point out that because these are ethical principles, then firms who, for whatever reason, haven't read PCRT have in many cases still demonstrated compliance with it, uh, but they encourage firms to read it and to apply it thoroughly. Uh, and so the report goes through some things that firms are doing very well, uh, things like having clear engagement letters and so on, and some practices where firms might need to sharpen up, uh, particularly around uh, clients who find errors, clients who aren't necessarily willing to correct errors, uh, and how we deal with those sorts of issues, as well as some of the more complex issues of tax avoidance. 
Other than that, the uh, practice assurance report talks about some of the other findings and hints at what some of the topics for review will be in the next few months. So um, if you're interested in practice assurance, if you've not had your visit and you're wondering what to expect, then certainly download the, uh, the article and we've got that in um, the accompanying newswire. Um, so go click the link and go and download the PDF for yourself. So the last thing then is pure audit. Now we've transitioned nicely there and we're going to talk about the release of ISA 240 revised on fraud. Now you might recall that this uh, exposure draft was produced by uh, a UK response to the Bryden review as part of this whole future of audit process that we're going through in the UK. So rather than being driven by changes to the international text, it's very much a UK specific revision and it aims to address some of the issues that Bryden raised in his review about the uh, the need to do all that we can to identify material fraud in uh, sets of financial statements. I think the feeling is that too much is made sometimes of this expectation gap um, of the fact that while the public might expect us to detect fraud, um, that's not necessarily something we can realistically achieve. Uh, this is really meant to press auditors towards um, a high degree of expectation that they will spot material fraud, uh, even if we can't get absolute assurance that that's the case. So a lot of the text is the same. Uh, changes are um, not substantial, I would say. Uh, I think the most substantial uh, change or um, emphasis has been on the uh, kind of pre-planning briefing meeting where risks are discussed and where a fraud conversation is usually had. Now, we as file reviewers find that's often not done particularly well, or at least it's certainly not documented that well on files. Uh, and many firms appear to pay lip service to discussion around fraud. And the enhanced text in the ISA aims to raise the bar for that conversation, that it should focus on the types of fraud that we might expect, maybe including some sector specific issues. Are we aware of what the frauds are in this particular industry, for example? Uh, and it focuses on management reporting fraud as well as misappropriation. The revised standard also increases the degree to which they expect auditors to discuss fraud with the client, both with management and, if different, with those charged with governance. Uh, there are one or two other useful parts um, in the revised standard. Um, more hints on what to do if you suspect that documents are not genuine uh, and some examples as to what to look for. Uh, much more focus on scepticism, as you might expect, and the kind of stand back requirement that means that we are constantly thinking about uh, whether our risk assessment that we made at planning is still appropriate uh, and making sure that we are not simply there to gather corroborative evidence, but we're there to look at all the evidence, including evidence that might contradict what the client is telling us. So once more, get the link to the revised ISA. We've got quite a long uh, lead time before this is implemented. It's coming in alongside the recently revised ISA 315. So that's periods commencing 15th of December this year. In other words, broadly, that's December 2022 year ends. So uh, a bit of a run up to implement the standard. It is early adoptable. I'm not sure how many people will formally early adopt it, but I think it certainly stands as best practice right now. So if you want a guide as to what we should be doing on fraud, then please go through the ISA and see how your teams measure up. And that is it for June. We will be back at the end of July with further updates on audit and accounting. But in the meantime, uh, here's to the end of lockdown and here's to a bit of sunshine to come as well. Uh, stay safe, look after yourselves and we'll see you in a month's time. Thanks all.